morning, everyone. My name is Michelle, and I'm here to introduce Sheree Boxover, who will be our presenter for today. After uh, the conclusion of this meeting, within a week, you will receive all the materials in an email to all the slides and all the materials you will need for this discussion. So now I'm going to pass it on to Sheree. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us bright and early for this edition of the Quality Exchange. Um, I'm the Regional Vice President for Heart Failure and Resuscitation for our six-state affiliate. Um, I am joined today by Katie Butterfield. You know she always joins us, um, Director of Quality and System Improvement for the State of Oklahoma. But um, um, she won't be speaking the whole time for us today. Um, she's down with a little bit of a throat issue. But uh, Katie has definitely continues to be a great resource for all of you across the affiliate. And so, um, welcome to the Quality Exchange. This is a quarterly phone call that's to allow hospital teams who are working so diligently to improve the care for our heart failure patients to come together, learn, share, and for us to find out what you're needing. So um, please invite your colleagues to join us. You do not have to be a part of Get With The Guidelines on Heart Failure to participate. We will um, talk about that program some since we do believe it is a great resource uh, for those of you working on process improvement, but everyone is welcome. And just so you know, we also have um, quality exchanges for resuscitation. That'll be tomorrow morning at the same time, atrial fibrillation, stroke, and coronary artery disease. So we have um, separate calls for each of those. So let me hop over to my slides and then I'll unpause you here. All right. And let's talk about what we're going to, I need to get this closed. Okay. What we're gonna talk about today, if I can get my slides, okay. We are gonna look over the current performance in heart failure related to our um, class one and two recommendations for heart failure across the six state affiliate. Uh, this is award time that is quickly approaching, so I'll give you some ideas where we are with that. I'm going to show you what you'll be receiving, those of you who are going to be recognized by the American Heart Association for your performance and get with the guidelines heart failure. Um, give you some ideas so you can start thinking about how you want to promote your recognition. And um, we'll take a few minutes if there's questions related to abstraction questions. Now, you can go ahead and enter those questions now into the Q&A box, and um, Michelle will help us with those when we get to that point. So if there are burning questions related to coding instructions or the use of Get With The Guidelines Heart Failure, go ahead and, and type those in. Uh, we're going to take a, a good glance at the 42-page Healthier Living With Heart Failure, and I hope you'll stick with me. I know sometimes people are like, my patients aren't going to use an online guide. Well, there are components inside this guide that I think you'll find helpful as part of your education. And then I want to talk about a program we've been doing and uh, maybe get some feedback, but share what we've been learning related to um, heart failure breakfast across the affiliate. Now, Michelle, I need to get rid of this participant list. No, don't want to do that. Eh, well, I'll just scooch it over there. All right, we are moving ahead. All right, well, as just a reminder, and I apologize because sometimes I am sharing things that you live every single day, but this is a very important slide. These are, in a nutshell, the most evidence-based uh, therapies, and we'll, throughout this uh, conversation, we might talk about guideline-directed medical therapies, or GDMT. These are the evidence-based um, heart failure therapies, and we are talking about reduced ejection fraction in this particular slide. So as you look at this slide, and as you think about the work you're doing on a daily basis, these are the elements of treatment that it is so crucial that your patients have um, unless they have a contraindication. I think sometimes we lose track of the fact that when you look at the use of an ACE or an ARB, that it has a 17% relative risk reduction in mortality and a 31% risk reduction in heart failure hospitalizations. Looking at those low numbers, fairly no, low numbers that are needed, uh, the number needed for treatment, um, quite low. 
when we think about ARNI, this new and yes, quite expensive medication, but when you see that the reduction in mortality and the reduction in hospitalizations. Now, when this says beta blocker, you know, and we all know that we're talking about this one of the three evidence-based beta blockers with an enormous um, reduction in mortality of 34% and 41% relative risk reduction in heart failure hospitalizations, such an important one. We'll look here at our performance on aldosterone antagonists, also a class one recommendation and not nearly um, adopted at that level, as well as some of these others, which we'll kind of back up as we go forward. So um, when we look at the participants in the Get With The Guidelines heart failure, you're gonna be seeing that data, of course, aggregated. If we have those of you on the phone who are not participating in Get With The Guidelines heart failure, it doesn't change the message that these are the class one recommendations you should be looking at. And we have tied them in to our different levels. So here where we see the second uh, black strip here, Southwest affiliate averages for achievement. Those are the four um, achievement measures, all class one recommendations that you should all be looking at, whether or not you're in Get With The Guidelines Heart Failure. Having ACE, ARBs, or ARNI at discharge of the hospitals that are putting in data in the quarter one, and notice that only 41 of our 86 contracted hospitals are putting in data, I encourage you to try to get this data in. Talk to your director of quality from the American Heart Association. See if you're a large enough program to be able to sample or to take advantage of our um, CSD uploader to be able to bring some of the data in. That being said, 86%, 90% of our hospitals that are putting in data, um, getting that evidence-based beta, evidence beta blocker on, measuring LV function, and then a little lower, and probably because we have some at 100 and we have some at 50, the post-discharge appointment for heart failure patients. That, that requirement, and for those of you who aren't get with the guidelines heart failure, is that you have an actual appointment, time, date, and location, in the discharge record, not saying see the doctor, not just an instruction, but the appointment has actually been made. So that is important. And we're having good performance of those of you who are participating. I will say that that is the biggest challenge in the post-discharge appointment. Um, also because there are a lot of no-shows. And when we talk about what we're learning in the heart failure breakfast, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Now, I would like to encourage um, participation by those of you on the phone. <laughs> you haven't been very uh, boisterous in past sessions, but I don't want to just uh, move on without um, giving hospitals who are on the line the opportunity to ask questions about, let's just stick with these three measures right now, or to share what has worked. So if you have, uh, and you can also type this in, and Michelle, interrupt me at any point as people type in, and tell me if you have questions as it relates to this top tier of guidelines and how to actually make that happen. You do star six and you'll come off mute and be able to talk to us, or you can type it in. So from the group, anyone with um, comments or suggestions on how to achieve these? Star six, please. and you can jump in there at any time. Now, when we think back to that list, and let's just go back there, and we're looking at all of these, and I've just picked out a few of them that are part of this. Sure. This was in Dr. Yes. We actually do have a question. Doesn't it right. confirm appointment with home health with date, time and date also count as discharge appointment? That is accurate. Home care is a little different, and so is nursing home you don't have to have the actual, I think, time, but you're still gonna work with when they're gonna be seen. And yes, that does um, meet the criteria. I should mention that some of you are um, using mobile integrated health and some other elements that are doing the post-discharge uh, integration as well, but you do have to um, document that in the discharge. <laughs> In your in your hospital record, uh, not after they've left. 
So um, those elements do count. Um, nursing home, I believe you only have to have the date because they don't know when that doctor who's related to the nursing home would be coming at exactly the time. Great. Other questions, star six? <clears throat> Marty commented that we have struggled with getting the follow-up scheduled for after hours and weekend discharges. We started calling Monday morning and calling patients with their appointment. Oh, that is, that is good. Um, you still need to have it in that record, so that, that makes sense. Uh, the other element related to that is that probably keeps your no-show. Marty, have you had any problems with that reminder? Is that really increasing the opportunity for them to show up? In some of our meetings, we've heard as high as 40, 50% no-show rates, which then makes your primary care, your heart failure clinic hesitant to take those appointments, take appointments that aren't going to be used. And you can let us know or add into that. Good. And don't hesitate to go ahead and write those things in. So when we're back on here, we talked about our, our top tier achievement. So that's going to be your Ace Arbor Arnie. Those are all combined into one thing because, you know, they, they kind of tie in in terms of which one you might be eligible for. Um, it's very unusual that you would have a contraindication to all three. So the number one uh, recommendation is ACE ARB ARNI. Then we look at our evidence beta blockers, and then let's jump down to our quality measures. So here's the performance in the Southwest affiliate for what we call plus measures or second tier quality measures. Now that doesn't mean these aren't class one recommendations. Many of these are. So we will mute off at 48%, um, and I know, please go back after this meeting and see how you're performing in that, 48% on a treatment that has a 30% and a 30% reduction in mortality and a 35% reduction in hospitalization. Now, I know people are hesitant, and I'd be interested in your feedback on how you're addressing the concern for um, hyperkalemia, because that is what can occur when you're using this. Um, any uh, anything concerns that have come up from your medical support as to why you are or not um, having a higher performance on aldosterone antagonist? Anyone? Star six. And if you're all on a t a typing, that's fine too. <laughs> I'll take the feedback either way. Oh, let's see. Morgan Fry had a question. What type of physicians are acceptable to meet the post-discharge follow-up appointment measure? Actually, there's not a requirement of the, of, I think you said physicians. You may have said positions, but Physician. it does need to be a, okay, it does need to be a physician-led opportunity. Now, that doesn't mean that a heart failure clinic with advanced practice staff that are working with a physician, that meets the criteria. So a lot of places are doing this through a heart failure clinic or they're doing it through um, some other mechanism with their cardiologist. They certainly can go back to their primary care physician, and that's a nice transition if you've figured out how to communicate all the medications they're leaving the hospital with and getting that to the primary care. It, of course, is going to apply to them being seeing a hospital, I mean, a, the physician at the skilled nursing if that was their home. Um, but they do need to be seen uh, uh, in a physician-monitored situation um, within seven days, and then that appointment does need to be on their calendar, it's, I mean, on their record, which is really, I know this is, I'm overstating the ease with which this can happen. <laughs> is there a follow-up on that, uh, Michelle, or did I only take the first part? No, that's fine. Okay. So it is in these appointments where you can confirm that a patient is getting these, these therapies, so the aldosterone antagonist. And you know the new medication, Arnie, I know it's very expensive. What I'm hearing at the heart failure breakfast is that um, it can be cost prohibitive or we have a large number of underserved or folks uh, in the homeless category that it's difficult finding the funding for this. Um, any comments as each of your hospitals have started um, really looking at uh, ARNIs? Because when you look at that, a, a significantly better survival 
than when you don't have Ace Arbor Arnie. Um, any feedback? And um, this is Marty from Hendrick Medical Center. Can you hear hey, me? Marty. I hey. can. Thank you. Um, one thing you know I brought to our CV Oversight Committee was adding the um, Arnie um, having a reason on the discharge um, order why they didn't do it. And my medical director mentioned that we've had patients discharged, like you said, the underserved, the unfunded, um, that they've gone with a prescription and they may get a 30-day um, card, but it's the ongoing that's the struggle and then also monitoring their labs outpatient because they're, a he said it's safe. Concern. Yeah. Yeah, he's, and his reason is he said that it was safer to do the lisinopril because they can get it for $4 at our pharmacy. And we certainly need, and that's why that achievement level one is ACE ARB Arnie. Right. Um, but we are keeping an eye on this, right and on. certainly. And every time it rains, um, it's clean. <laughs> <laughs> Who, have have, heard, who out there has got a good solution or has been doing well with using the pharma support to get this approved for some folks if it's a medication they can't approve? Has anybody have had good luck with that? I think Oklahoma State, when we were at a heart failure breakfast, reported us they had a 100% um, approval rate. Anyone else having good luck or have a, a process that you are getting these medications approved through the pharma angle? For the for the uh, lower socioeconomic group, and you can let us know through writing too. Anyway, it's certainly a concern as new drugs come out. The cost of those. I just read an article that said that the average cost for the medications for a heart failure patient, um, class two or three, is five hundred and sixty-one dollars a month. That clearly does not include Arnie. <laughs> um, so even on other medications, thinking about that. Now, I understand that the $4 list has helped quite a bit for some of these drugs. Um, but anyway, that kind of gives you an idea of the, the cost burden for this disease. Um, and feel free to hop in at any point about any of these. Um, when we look at, and let's just go over, and we talked about that follow-up visit, it's very difficult to get that visit in seven days or less. Um, I've had a plea at our heart failure breakfast to make that seven business days. <laughs> um, our, our clinical team has not changed that, our physicians who lead these recommendations, um, just because your physical body <laughs> doesn't uh, know about business days, it's clear that it is the first seven days when we have the most likelihood of either um, <laughs> going downward or coming back into the hospital if they don't have a way uh, to follow up. Any comments on the seven days or less, getting them in in seven days or less? Is that near impossible in your various markets? All right, so going ahead across, so you can see as you look, and you can't concentrate on everything at once. And um, I tell you what, if I was going to make a suggestion whether or not you use Get With The Guidelines Heart Failure, and of course, I'm going to highly encourage you to use this tool, heart failure is a growing, growing diagnosis. Um, it is not going to get smaller. It's getting larger. And the fact of the matter is probably almost every admission to your hospital that's over 60 years of age or maybe under that has heart failure in one of their diagnoses levels, if you go down a few. We have got to figure out how to manage these patients in an efficient way. So in doing that, I encourage you to meet and identify your heart failure champion position. And I tell you, with the, the removal of the core measure, a lot more hospitals are not, um, they can't tell me who their heart failure champion is. Maybe because their heart failure champion is outpatient. Um, I don't know. Um, are any of you having a struggle finding a physician um, to be your heart failure champion? It sounds like you have one, Marty. Anyone having a struggle with that? You feel like you're working on an island?
Well, I encourage you to find one and meet with them and look over this chart and identify if you have built these into your uh, discharge instructions, built them into your order set, at least these. Where are you reporting your performance in these? Because these are the things that make the difference in, in readmission, but more importantly, in mortality, and probably even more important than that, in the quality of life for our patients. So I encourage you to meet with them before the next time we, we get together in a quarter to make sure that they're incorporated. Um, I have a wonderful document. If you don't have it, it's available in the PMT. And for those of you who aren't get with the guidelines heart failure, I'll be glad to share it with you. It's the logic and rationale for every one of these measures. Um, within Get With The Guidelines Heart Failure, you can actually run your discharge medication um, by floor if you've put that in. And if you are not putting that in, talk to your AHA Director of Quality about how do I look at, at performance by unit? How do I look at performance by physician? How do I look at these by day of the week? We started running the chance of them having a post-discharge appointment in their record by day of the week. And the fact is, that, and this makes perfect sense, if a patient is admitted on Wednesday or Thursday, they are the most likely to fall out on that measure. So you have to build in things for those patients that are arriving on Wednesday and Thursday to make sure they're going to have an appointment when they are um, suddenly discharged on Saturday or Sunday. Any other way you're looking at this so you're finding out um, how you can impact your patients being on these medications when they are discharged. Star six uh, to mute and star six to unmute, and, or you can type it in for Michelle. She's monitoring that. All right, well, we'll move along. I want to talk about a few of the data deadlines for those of you. If somebody is unmuted, so you may want to star six and put yourself back on mute. Um, Data deadlines, uh, great news because the all of your 2017 data, your directors have looked through that. I know many of you have worked on your, on your results on 2017, clear up to the end of March, and that's when we drew the, the line in the sand. And so the award applications have been submitted. So in May, we expect the awards to be announced and sent out. And remember, we're a little bit behind. It's always a little confusing because those awards will be based on 2017 data. Um, I'm going to come back to this. Um, just a few reminders before I come back. June 7th, I believe, is the last day to submit abstracts for scientific sessions. If you've been working on something in heart failure, let's get an abstract written and get it submitted, perhaps for a poster or for a presentation. So um, you can email us, swaquality at heart.org or myself, you'll see my email at the end of this, or your director of quality in your area, and we will help you. So you know, July, the U.S. News and World Report ad will be out that'll have the gold and silver hospitals. I'm gonna talk a little more about that. And then you can see as we go along July, October, you're gonna be getting updates on your QT and Q2 and Q3 snapshots. Um, the gold and silver hospitals, um, uh, I, this may actually be changed, but the Gold and Silver Hospitals will be recognized. I had heard we may be recognizing it at a different, facility, a different meeting, but um, tentatively at scientific sessions. And then, of course, we're heading toward the deadline of February uh, for the deadline for completing your 18 data. And I know that's far away, but sometimes by the time we get to May and you've only got January, it starts catching up on you. So when you are recognized as a get with the guidelines, um, recognized heart failure hospital, you will be sent um, an ad kit. And the ad kit's gonna look somewhat like this. And in fact, I think this is the actual one. This happens to be for a heart failure goal plus. When you get this, the first thing you want to do is to forward the email to your marketing department. Because in here are some guidelines um, on how you can use these icons um, this is an excellent document, promotional guidelines that gives you some ideas, but it also gives you the rules uh, for promoting your recognition. You'll also have multiple different versions of the icon that you can use 
throughout your advertising. These are in different uh, different uh, EPS. You won't even be able to see it. The EPS version is for a really high quality. Your marketing folks will know that. Also, you have a news release, a news release that is already ready to go for you to be able to open that up and add in your hospital name, maybe even get your own quote. Again, you should be able to get support from your marketing um, and PR staff. This is how it looks. Uh, this is usual for your marketing folks. They'll add in your name with your exact award. Um, there's quotes in here from our team as well. And so this is a great opportunity to get this sent out to your local media. I want to point out something that's also on here, and these are ways on social media to post uh, your recognition. So here's examples for Twitter and Facebook, um, things that you can have all of your staff put out um, related to that. So back to our page. I need to get off of this. Sorry, I'm lost. Okay, so back to our link. The other things that are there, which I want you to be able to take advantage, there are actual print advertisements that are set up. So, and let's look at the smaller so you can see it. Where you can just put in your logo at the bottom of the ad that are ready to go, showing that you've been recognized. This is great for your newsletters. It's great for your internal things. You can have posters around your hospital that are easily printed, and this is all ready to go for you. There's also a digital advertisement that's in a different format that you can put on your website and put your own hospital logo there. And there is actually verbiage for a radio ad as well that can be used. Um, just real quickly, if you're putting this icon, um, the icon that I showed you, if you're putting that on anything, we do need to see that um, before you go to print. So some people have put this, I've seen it put on the side of a building where it rolls off from the top to the bottom and I've seen it on a cake. So anyway, if you're using these icons, please, um, you'll see in the, in the guidelines there's a place for you to follow up on that. So that is the link. I want you to fully use that and really take advantage. Now, if you're a gold or silver recognized hospital, you will also um, be a part of U.S. News and World Report in the, um, actually in the, I think it's the August version, but it comes out in July. And just to give you a sense for how that looks, um, this is how it was last year. I can't guarantee you that's exactly how it'll be, but um, you click on the state and you're able to see, and the gold ones, these are our heart failure hospitals when they're gold. It gives you an idea of the recognized facilities with the gold circle. So anyway, you want to take advantage of this. We'll also, you can promote this as well as we will do um, little printouts of it with just the pages, not the whole magazine, but with the U.S. News and World Report pages only. So anyway, as your awards come, please plan to promote them, and your director is more than happy to come and present your um, plaque to you at a leadership meeting, uh, to your CEO, at a all-team meeting. Um, we have presented these at Go Red events. We've presented them at Heart Walks. <laughs> so um, just be creative on that. Any questions as it relates to recognition? And you can also type those in, so anything you have related to um, the award process. If you have not been recognized, I encourage you really get into your data for um, in January. Uh, get all this year put in. If you haven't been recognized before, you can actually be recognized for only 90 days. So you can actually have a, an award ceremony this year based on a quarterly performance. Um, any questions, Michelle, come up on that? Not on the website, but do you have a couple for follow-up? Um, back to okay. the follow-up. Uh, yeah. Can you confirm that post-discharge appointments can be made with a PCP, or does it have to be a cardiologist? 
It does not have to be a cardiologist. It has to be a physician-led initiative. So that means if a physician is running a heart failure clinic and, and those staff are working on behalf of him or her account, they definitely can go back to their PCP. And in fact, in an ideal situation, that will be a great place to make the transition back to their primary care. Um, it would also encourage primary care to refer into um, cardiologists for consulting if they knew they were getting their patients back. So that's actually a perfect scenario. So if you have great success in that, I'd like to hear how you're doing it because that's a little harder to get uh, the appointments sometime, but yes. Now you need to prepare those physicians with what the medications are. They should get a transition report of some sort that they can either pull or is sent to them so that they know how to handle the patient. Because there's nothing more frustrating than getting a pretty high acuity patient back but you don't know what happened at the hospital. Is there another one, Michelle? Yes, yeah, same topic. Can it be a late entry into the record? That they, act, that they can act a late entry. Oh, no, it needs to be at the time of discharge. So you're actually educating the patient. Um, and when you look at those coding instructions, do you recall, um, you might look those up specifically while we're talking, uh, Michelle, and pull up that section, but I believe it has to be in there. Will you double check that while we're going? I will. You may have already written that, thank you. And we'll get back to you before we end the call. I want to just look at that specifically. Other questions, star six. Something I want to encourage you to do today, and I know this is repetitive, but I, not that many people have signed up, so I'm going to encourage you again. And you'll get these slides afterwards to go to this heart.org target HF, and we're going to go there together. <laughs> and first of all, to sign up, I don't, even if you're not getting with the guidelines heart failure, I would like you to sign up as a hospital and as individuals to register as a participant in target heart failure, that you're really working. Now let me show you how that looks and what that involves. And it doesn't cost money. And when you go here and you register, you will actually, one person will start the registration here for the hospital and it does have to have the hospital name. And then what you'll do is you will add, here's a second person who else works with you and you can add another one. So you will add your little heart failure team so that it's all hospital centric, but you're, but you're registered separately, but under that hospital name. And once you have registered for this, then you will receive on target, which is a newsletter that is just for you, for professionals in um, heart failure. This isn't a patient newsletter. And this, um, and you may even have articles you want to have put in on target if there's some things you're doing particularly well. So I encourage you to go in and register your hospital because I know because you're on this call <laughs> that you care about those, those patients and you can start receiving that benefit. The other things that are here are quite nice tools. And I wanted to point out one, which is, on the right page. oh, I might have to go on a different page. Okay, that's the registration page. Let's go back, because I want to be able to show you these. Um, the other thing that is on here is, of course, it talks about get with the guidelines heart failure. Um, by just saving a couple of admissions each year, you can easily pay for the Get With The Guidelines Heart Failure module and abstraction. And if you're worried about the FTEs to do that, um, reach out to me. I can do an ROI and look at what that costs. If you're about to lose your Get With The Guidelines Heart Failure because it just costs too much, too much abstraction, I ask that you reach out because we definitely have, um, have a scientifically based return on investment for the product and know that it, it will, in the end, save you a significant amount of money. But I'm not gonna go for there today. I do wanna talk about these strategies and the strategies section is good as well. Some wonderful resources, but the one that I wanna point out to you is if you are going to be going through your patients who have been readmitted and you want to have a really thorough 
documents to look at those. So this is a case review, a case review of everyone who is a heart failure readmission. And you can go through this document, and it not only tells you what tip typical breakdowns are, and um, certainly this number one, failure to actively include the patient and family caregivers in identifying the needs, resources, and planning for discharge. And number two, this unrealistic optimism of patient and family to manage that heart failure regimen at home. Um, I believe in our Fort Worth heart failure breakfast, someone stated, you know, maybe we're not giving everybody, we're not being firm enough in the, the truth about this diagnosis and what needs to be done, and maybe the family finds themselves um, caught off guard. So anyway, this is a very good um, document. Here's the breakdowns and handoff communication. So you would start going through your patients. I'll show you, here's the worksheet. As you may even be able to incorporate it, a patient interview, say at a heart failure clinic, interview why that patient ended up being uh, back in the hospital. Talk about if they had any instructions when they went home. We know we're sending home with a ton of stuff. I think the question is, are the patients able to benefit from that? This is an important one, and maybe even something you can do at their first appointment in a in an outpatient setting is tell me what you remember from your instructions <laughs> at the hospital. I think that would be really telling. And this isn't because our nurses aren't trying. It's not because they don't get the information. It's just that they're overwhelmed. So anyway, I encourage you to look at this. This is a really great opportunity if you want to study your readmissions and figure out um, how to make a difference. So I encourage you to look at that. Many other things here, but the thing I want to show you that I promised to show you is the um, tool. 42 page, uh, well we have the new HF path, but I want to show you the heart failure guide. This is free, you just have to go online um, it's wonderful for caregivers who might be more um, inclined to use an online tool, but even if you have a, an older population, a, a homeless population, uh, any population, this can be helpful to you because you can use parts of this. So all throughout the guide, I want to point out to you that there are audios and there are I'll show you one, videos. So this is an example of a video. Watch this animation to learn. So if you have a patient who's waiting to talk to you for the first time, you could use the audio as an introduction to what heart failure is. Instead of having, you can actually accomplish two things at once or have the front office staff put them in the room and be able to listen to this. So you can actually use these audio clips, and you can just go into the audio clip. I'll stop it. I have to stop it. And you can click that link and have that available for every patient. It goes through the general understanding, then managing, then treating, and then living well. And all through this guide, you can print these by the page or you can print them, you can print the whole thing, or you can give this link for families to do this. So this is an example of how a healthy heart pumps, but I, and I'm not sure you're gonna be able to hear the audio, so, but I'll show you this briefly. These are YouTube, so then you can save this and know where to get them. And it gives a really good example of how systolic heart failure, there's one in here for diastolic, it shows you how too little of blood is pumped. So these are excellent animations that you can use as part of your education, even if you don't plan to be able to use the whole document. So we've got the what a heart looks like with heart failure. We've got causes of heart failure, theme and audio as well as
Cherie, you're still there? You lost your audio. So sorry, let me see if I can get her back on. I think her connection might. Okay, Cherie's going to hop back on in just a little bit. All right, I'm back. There you go. I can hear you, Sheree. Great. Sorry, guys. Technology. Now you got like 10 screens on top. I don't know what this is doing. <laughs> and that is 30 copies of the program. Okay, just a minute. Uh, I don't know why that's happening. Okay, let's get back to our slide. Oh, I love technology. All right. So let's go back to that really quickly. I apologize. But as you can see, even if you don't lose connection, uh, the tool has a lot of opportunity. I love that you can print um, a single page. I think that to me is one of the most important elements. So if there is something in there that you want to be able to use, then you can for sure just print that, that one page or just play that one audio or just show the one video. Um, again, it's called Explore My HF Guide. So I would encourage you to have it on your, on your uh, laptops, on uh, app, iPads, whatever you're using in the place. Let me show you just a little more of this. I won't, we lost some time there. Um, I love this section where it really talks about shortness of breath. So every time they came in, you could actually have a different audio played. Um, knowing that you're probably giving them handouts that work for this, but also that you're giving them uh, audio. So which kind of learner are we? It has the supporting, here's our zone uh, document. So to be able to hand this to them while they're paying attention to what are those emergency things that they should be paying attention to. You can also use this tool with your skilled nursing facilities as well. Um, I know sometimes, um, they, you know, they don't have a ton of registered nurses in, in a skilled nursing. The teams there are doing an excellent job, but sometimes they're not paying attention to the weight gain, to some of these elements that they don't, they might not know are related to um, heart failure. Okay. Sure. Do these resources yeah. also in Spanish? Um, I believe that all of the, all of the um, sheets are in Spanish and English. I need to check. Do you know, Michelle? That's a good question about the whole guide. Do you know? Because all, no. all of the worksheets are in Spanish. I'll actually follow up with National, make sure the guide is also in Spanish. Yeah, uh, we'll double check, but all of these, all of these uh, PDFs are available in Spanish. In fact, let me show you where you get those. What you do, uh, the logos and everywhere. Well, let's go back to our slides so I can show you. Um, the, the educational tools, when you go there, um, are under the Resource Center for Rise Above HF. And so let's see, this is the interactive workbook, take the quiz, um, self-check plan. I know, here we go, how I live with heart failure. Here's a few of these, the, the patient information sheets are all in Spanish. 
Um, I will do a more thorough email about which um, of the tools are completely available in Spanish. So, Michelle, if you'll write that note for me, I will follow up with everyone, because I know we have a large um, Spanish patient population, and I want to be able to, to show you those, so I will make sure. These are the patient tools. We've, they're integrated into the heart failure guide, or you can get them separately. There's also, in the Rise Above HF, other nice guidelines that show you exactly, you know, what's ejection fraction. Um, all, most all of these are tools that you would use in your practice, and I've, I've gone over these, I think, in a past one. And then don't forget, and Katie did a lovely presentation this last quarter, but don't forget that we have this app, targethf.heart. It's a progressive app, so you don't go to the app store to get it. And on there are, are the tools, and you can see that all of these, what is heart failure, has Spanish how I can live with heart failure, has Spanish, what is high blood pressure, so on and so forth. This can be right on your handheld, on your phone, on your iPad. Um, it has the links to the workbook that I just showed you, and um, these documents on the app are all English and Spanish. Um, it also has all of our webinars are on there. So when do you have time to go back and listen to a webinar? This happens to be a webinar about 30-day rehospitalization. You can just listen to it right on your phone or iPad. So these are important resources for you. Got the calculators in there, an interactive patient tool. And don't forget about guidelines on the go, which is an app. Uh, you should have that on your phone so that you can be up to date on any of the guidelines as we change them. Questions or resources that you have not seen in this list that you desperately need. Come off mute star six or type it in. Things for education that you just can't find or you feel like you're going to have to make it from scratch. Anything? All right. Well, you can let us know. Um, we are in the listening mode, <laughs> although I have been blabbing on the whole time. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, that's fine. Uh, we're getting a list of them, and we'll go ahead and make a note. Uh, defibrillator pamphlets in Spanish. So we're going to go ahead and look at what we have for Spanish and send a complete list of that as well. Um, Wonderful. So keep those coming in in the written section. And um, we will tell you what we find and if there's something that has to be created, what we don't have, but we'll let you know. Thank you. Keep those coming in. Um, so this Heart Failure Breakfast series, we have been going around the six states and trying to talk to groups uh, to hear what you need. So uh, the goal was to, we always meet with STEMI coordinators, we always meet with stroke coordinators, we know who they are, we can send them an email, but we don't necessarily know who all of you are who all the champions are for heart failure. So this was the goal, was to develop a heart failure collaborative. And these are the cities where we have or will be having, oops, my Little Rock is actually June, so I just saw an error. June 13 for Little Rock, June 14 for Northwest Arkansas, I apologize. Um, but May 6 for Houston is correct. Um, we have been in these cities finding out what heart failure folks need. These are the roadblocks that have, have been spoken about in multiple places, loss of financial support for heart failure programs that were working, transportation, the medication. Um, an interesting one, they're wondering if AHA can impact that food banks or Meals on Wheels really don't have heart failure friendly options. So where we're guiding them on a low sodium path, we're making recommendations, when they need to have these sources for their, for their uh, food, they don't have those options. Um, inconsistency between inpatient, outpatient, home care, teaching, uh, cardiac rehab availability in the rural communities. And there have been many, many, many more, but I wanted to put a few here. For those of you on the phone, can you tell me what your key roadblock is? Just star six, your key roadblock, the number one thing, if you solved it, with your heart failure patients that, um, you know, you could, you could retire happy. What are those things? Star six. Anything? Well, 
people type them in because we're interested in hearing those roadblocks. Um, Great, sure. And I also wanted to make yes. note that the um, appointment was May 8th. What? Oh, the Houston's May 8th? Yes. Doing terrible here. Um, we're just going to correct that here. We'll fix that right up uh, before we send these slides out. So make a note of that, Michelle. I apologize. May 8th, May, uh, June 13th, June 14th. And if Perfect. any of you want to be in, a, if you would like to have a remote heart failure breakfast, you want to give us your feedback, um, let Michelle know that, and we could have another one. We're trying to get all over the six states, but we may have missed your area. So what is working? Alternative transportation. There's cities that are using Lyft. They're losing, using Uber. Um, I think MedStar even has a agreement with Uber in Fort Worth, kind of interesting. We're seeing mobile integrated health where paramedics are actually being sent out to do follow-up. We had, saw that in Temple and in Fort Worth. Anyone on the phone using mobile integrated health have um, access to paramedics who are assisting you, star six. It's really kind of cool when you think about uh, the opportunity to get into the home in a short time frame, be able to kind of evaluate uh, the living situation, caregiver behavior, et cetera. Um, many places where they have been able to provide the first 30 days of medication. When you think about if the cost of the medication in the first month is $500, certainly if that prevents a readmission, that is worth it. Uh, many outpatient heart failure clinics either kicking off or getting more support. Uh, interesting, um, with docs actually seeing the heart failure, the heart failure experts are actually seeing the patients in the emergency department instead of having them admitted or gone to observation. They're actually seeing them in the ED, and in many cases being able to redirect them to home care um, where they can, um, you know, be diaries at home. They don't necessarily have to do that in the hospital for some patients. Um, the role of the inpatient nurse, uh, educating the entire hospital stay, and I love this. We had a very passionate physician who truly believes that physicians should be echoing the education provided by the nurse. So you know the hard part of that is they have to find out what the nurse has educated so that they can, they can um, reinforce it. We know that if they had both the physician and the nurse doing that. So, so heart failure breakfast. Um, we're learning a lot, and the goal for us to be able to see, and also based on the list of things you're sending to Michelle, where are those resources that we can help you that you don't have to create them on your own? How can we work together in synergistic method to get your patients the information they need? So we have a few minutes, um, and I had asked for roadblocks. Did anybody put some in there in writing, uh, Michelle, no. the biggest roadblocks? No, but we do have a couple of other questions. Would the paramedic follow-up fulfill the follow-up appointment measure? It does not, um, unless the, it, you know, the, it has to be a, an appointment measure. It's doing the 30-day follow-up. That's where they're putting it in. They're not necessarily putting it in the first seven days. They're putting it in the seven to 30 day. So they've seen somebody in the heart failure clinic. That's what they're doing there. You're being seen in the heart failure clinic <laughs> within seven days then a paramedic is getting into your home within the seven to 30 days. So that's how they're doing it. And by the way, there's no way to be paid for that right now. So in that particular situation, the hospital is funding that. Now they feel like they've had savings and readmissions from that, but it, it's not an inexpensive proposition. We also had a comment about, uh, we utilize the EMS, home health and telemedicine services to monitor our patients. The question is getting their follow-up records into our EMR. Oh, yeah. So making the trans, it's, that really is, I think, there's two tricky technical things. When you're in the hospital, getting the list of all the heart failure patients, which is still very difficult. Um, and secondarily, if it's not the same system, how do you make that transition report? How do you get the transition report to that follow-up. How are you using telemedicine? Are they actually uh, visualizing? Whoever said that, if you can come off uh, mute, star six, tell me how you're using that. I've wondered about telemedicine and heart failure. Just star six and you can talk at us. 
think that he, uh, I'm the one who uh, prompted that. Oh. And we are not actually using the visuals out of telemedicine. We are using like the telehome health avenue for that. Um, and we're continuing to keep up with our patients with follow-up phone calls and having their daily weights and vitals and such remote ah. back in. So that's and so the home care right. then will respond if their weight has gone up, if Correct. so on and so forth. They'll, they'll respond on the phone and then in person if needed? Correct. It identifies those early triggers that even patients may not be as aware of. So it continues to send that in to the disease. The information is being evaluated by the nursing staff. So it worked out well, but again, I'm the one who made the comment about the barrier being having that information relate back into our EMR. So once the patient is discharged from the hospital, that care, like the, the, the torch is passed essentially, and the care is being monitored in the outpatient setting. So without that information ah. being fed back into us, then if the patient comes back and they are readmitted or they do have some type of problem, then we don't, we here at the hospital level can't connect those dots. We have to start chasing down the avenue of um, what happened to them out there. So, so it's the opposite. It's the, right. we, you can transition to them, but if yes. that patient comes back, you don't know anything that happened out there in that agreement, in that okay. world. Oh, that is okay. a big challenge. Because in the hospital world, at the time of discharge, that record is. It's not yeah. an ongoing storytelling event. So when the patient does come back, all we can see is that they were discharged three weeks ago. But the gap of and what happened in the meanwhile, you would think that all of that would be coordinated, say, through the heart trader clinic or possibly through primary care or the cardiologist or the somebody else, and especially <laughs> from a remote area. And it, it becomes a challenge of, so who do I find out where this story is broken. So yes, we Yeah, that is. We we definitely can transition our information to them and in most cases they dial in and they can see our EMR. So they can pull what they need from us. The problem is that we can't see into their EMR to be able to continue the story. So well, we, we that's a legitimate problem, them. yeah. So yeah. you just end up calling and finding out I mean it ends up being you either ignore it or you have to do quite a bit of digging, it sounds like. Right. So. And on Saturday mm -hmm. night at 8 o'clock, that's not the most optimal time to find who's, yeah. it, you know, who, where do you start at Saturday night at 8 o'clock. So on Monday, when case management gets in and your social workers come in and then all the, all the um, dots start being connected, well, then the patient's ready to be discharged on Tuesday. So now you've hurried up and gotten there last three weeks worth of information only to just merely notice because it's not like it affected the care you delivered over the last couple of days over the weekend and now you have to deal with that transition back to but are we going to continue to order for telemedicine are we going to continue to order for whatever it, that's where the problem really comes from is not being able to trend and even here on the hospital side with your heart failure teams and your consensus teams and you're trying to devise the right order set because we've done all of that addressing, I didn't come in earlier, but addressing everything with the aldosterones and everything else. Mm -hmm. We've done our part so that when they leave our building, we have them equipped, but to be able to truly track if, if that's being effective, that's where your disconnect happens because it's not in your house anymore. Yeah. Other people. I tell you what, it's, you know, we've dealt with Mission Lifeline, STEMI and Stroke and all these, and the fact of the matter is this is a system that we're mm -hmm. going to have to figure out how you close the loop, you know, and, and, and in fact, in some cases, if you take a bundled payment, you know, you'll have to close the loop for financial benefits. So very good point. And what hospital are you with? I missed that. I'm with the Baptist uh, Systems out of Memphis. Okay. Very interesting. Very interesting work. Well, we're, we're just about out of time. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's another element. We always think about the transition hospital out, 
And that's the first time it's really, my light bulb came on. Um, that's not the only transition <laughs> if these patients are coming back. So thank you so much for sharing that. Cherie, I'm will going we have to, yep, their um, heart failure breakfast in Austin? Um, we've had two and we're gonna have another one scheduled. So if you wanna be on that invite, just um, uh, type there to Michelle and we'll make sure you get invited to our next one. So Perfect. absolutely, it's, we've had a couple, but we are continuing on. So please put that in. So um, let us know what you need. You're typing them in, Michelle's capturing that. I owe you an answer. I know she probably was taking those down and wasn't able to get the answers or relates to the specifics of what meets the criteria for the um, post-discharge appointment. So I'll follow up with the specifics on that out of the coding instruction, as well as the information related to Spanish project products. And then we'll do a whole list of our, of our uh, uh, roadblocks that came up as well as any questions. You probably know your local AHA quality director and he or she is your first line of contact, but if you're not sure, you can do SWA quality at heart.org or to myself at sheree.boxberger at heart.org. Any final comments um, before we go, Michelle? No, but I do see a lot of questions about the follow-up appointment. So we're gonna go ahead and make a one-pager just so we have the most commonly um, asked questions today about follow-up and we'll send that out as well within um, one to two weeks. Great idea, yeah. If you put a question in there, we won't ignore you and we'll send it out to the whole group with answers. So thanks so much for taking your time and um, please join us next quarter for our quality exchange, which I believe is, oh, do we have those dates, Michelle? I should have had those, this is our first one. It is uh, the last week of July, I believe. So we will um, send out uh, the form for that with the follow-up from this meeting. So thanks to everyone. Have a great day.